There are a couple of other tools that can help you understand the WMI model. So it's a namespace based model. One of the tools, there's a couple of tools I'm going to share with you here. One of them I have downloaded and it's called, uh, where am I, the WMI Code Creator. So it's just uh, three separate words. Uh, if you went to your search engine of choice, WMI Code Creator. Just so you can see that right there. And it's free. It's from Microsoft. It's rather old, probably about four or five years old at this point, and ultra buggy, but it's very helpful for understanding WMI. So what I can do, I've already in, uh, just extracted it, and it's just an executable here with the C-sharp source code. And so it's loading the WMI classes. And so we can write over here a query against WMI. And there you go. Or you could execute WMI methods, receive events, which is really what the event watcher task is doing. It's receiving an event. Or browse the various namespaces on the computer. So we could browse, like if we were working with our SQL Server and we wanted to browse uh, for certain SQL Server related namespaces and classes, then we would come down, uh, where's my MS SQL Server here, am I in the right spot here, oh, where did I mess up, Microsoft SQL Server, I was high up. So there's 53 classes in that particular namespace. And so what we would do is we could look for events like creating tables. Uh, we could look for instance creation. We create tables. We can list the properties that a target instance property occurred. Now you can list any methods or qualifiers, which doesn't really help us in this case. But it gives us an idea of some of the logic of what's going on. So we're saying coming from an instance creation event I want to know where the property target instance is a this is not ISA as an ISA server this is is a type of CIM directory contains file now some of you coming from SQL might be wondering why isn't this an equal statement well this is a class this is not a technically a value so we do an is a test for this particular class. So we're looking to see where this target instance is a CIM directory contains file. And the directory name is SSIS file watcher. So this is the query. Okay, I'm going to copy this. We actually need to create that folder here before this will help us out. So let me just say new folder SSIS file watcher. So if you want to follow at home, you can uh, do this as well. Just create yourself a folder, SSIS file watcher. I put mine on the root of the C. That's fine. And I'm going to copy this particular query. So we say OK. And I go to my WQL, my WMI event watcher task. And I go to the options. And the first thing we have to do is make a WMI connection. So let's make a new connection. We're connecting to our local host. We're connecting just to the default namespace. I'm not really going to change anything except for I'm going to tell it to use Windows authentication. Make sure to test it and thankfully it comes back successful. And I'm going to pass in the WQL query as direct input. We'll talk about variables a little bit later. If I had that stored in a file, by the way, I could make a file and I could connect to like a WQL file. No problems doing that. But I'm just going to use direct input and I'm going to paste the query that I copied directly from my file. Say OK. And now the rest of it is actually fairly easy to understand. Let's just dig down here uh, and try to understand what's going on. So action at event right here. Let me get my pen. Sorry. Man, how did I do that? Drop my pen. Okay, so action at event. So in other words, right here, when the event occurs that you're watching for, so when this query returns a row, what do you want to have happen? Well, I want to log the event, 
and then I want to fire the SSIS event. In other words, I want to return with success. So after this event, I want to return <laughs> with success. Golly, Scott. Okay. So as soon as a row comes back from my WQL query, I'm going to log it, and then we're returning success. Now, I'm going to set a timeout down here at the bottom. You see my timeout value. This is in seconds. So the default is zero, which is never timeout. I'm going to put in, let's come over here and let's say, we'll put in a five-second timeout. And at the timeout, that's action at timeout, I want to log the timeout, and then I want to return failure. Now we can change these. We could say only log the event, okay, and then only log the timeout here. And that this is only going to really be too handy if you're doing package logging, like we talked about uh, in chapter three. Okay? But I want to fire the event, which we haven't really dealt with uh, SSI uh, S events here, but. Uh, you could see the event handlers, so we could set up an event handler for that. Not going to cover those just yet. We'll cover those later. Okay, so we've given it, what did we do? I forgot. Get to talking. So we gave it five seconds, and if no file hits that folder within five seconds, then you know what? We're going to say failure. Okay. Now there's a curious piece here. So we said five seconds. However, our polling interval is 10 seconds, right? Hmm. Generally speaking, you would want those to be, like, this would be the minimum that you would have. So I just looked at that to realize I want this to at least be the minimum of my polling interval here. So I say OK. And I'm just going to hit OK. I'm not going to go add any files to that particular folder. You can kind of mentally count to 10 seconds. The event watcher task is just really sitting here for 10 seconds, waiting, looking to see if it happens. And no file had hit that particular folder. OK, so perfect. We got exactly what we expected. No file hit. We told it to time out after 10 seconds. Okay. So if we come over here and change this to a 0, we say OK. And take a look here. It's just going to sit here and wait and wait and wait. And you can actually have a continuously running package constantly watching for a file to hit a folder. Now, when the file does hit the folder, let's go cause a file to hit that folder by creating it. So I'm going to make a new file. Notice that it did not immediately fire. Oh, well, there it came back. <laughs> it won't necessarily immediately fire. I think about it as though there's a clock. Let me see if I can draw this out without getting too annoying here. Um, so I think about it as like there's a clock broken down into 10 second segments. And there is, is that one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And so there's a hand that's just sweeping around the clock. So the, and I can't really draw this, this won't really work, but it, the hand is just constantly moving, so it starts here, and it's just continually going. And the file may actually have hit right here at that point, but because the hand of the clock was down here, it hasn't seen it yet. And so when it finally comes back, bing, it notices that it's there. Okay, so that's kind of how it works. There can be a delay between when the event occurs and you actually get notification that the event has occurred. Okay. So let's try let me try it this time. It just so happened maybe we were closer on the clock hand. Uh, let's do it again. Let's uh, change our polling interval down here, the timeout to 20 seconds. And I say go and I'm gonna go add now a file to that. And I'll keep this over here so we can maybe see it behind the scenes. So just go add a new document to it. Okay, it hadn't happened. Now it finally happened. So it took it only about a second that time. It might have taken up to 20 seconds, just depending on where that clock hand had been. Okay, so this is the basics of the event watcher. You're waiting for something to happen. When something happens, let's move forward with executing 
the rest of the package. So really here we would now, instead of doing a pop-up, we would really probably load up some data scrubbing or maybe load that into the database. And I have a couple of other ideas for you as well. Like you might want to wait for a certain process to kick off. So you can have a, uh, a WMI event watcher task that's just sitting there waiting for an application to kick off. Once that application starts, now it's time to do something in the uh, SQL Server, in the integration services. I used profiler.exe in this case. You might have a third party application. So just substitute that with exactly what you would see in the task manager. So like I'm in the task manager, go to the processes, and it's whatever this process name is. So as soon as profiler.exe shows up in the running processes, then my WMI event watcher would run. So like I'll show you this one. All I have to do is change the query. So just change that to profiler and set my timeout to 20 seconds. It's sitting there waiting. It's running, it's waiting. Is there a profiler.exe? Not yet. It'll wait for 20 seconds. I go launch profiler before the timer runs out. So I've now launched profiler. And at any point now, because profiler is a running process, the WMI event watcher is going to, that clock hand is going to sweep through and it's going to find it. Ah, It says miserable failure because the clock hand got to the very top and yet it didn't see profiler so it didn't sweep back through uh, let me see if I can do this a little faster this time uh, so I'm gonna start it and I'm gonna go straight to profiler here see if we can get it to show this time and so profiler is running if we say there we go we got the watcher was successful so you get that idea um, that I showed you earlier, you need to make sure that this timeout exceeds whatever your polling interval, or is at least equal to the polling interval. Usually you want it to be larger. Um, now let me come back, and I'll finish with this. What is a proper polling number? Well, it's probably a fairly decent size number. 30 would be a minimum here probably, uh, because the more frequently you are polling the system, the more you're placing a drag on the system resources. The WMI is not the most efficient uh, system, so it can be pretty intense. So just, you know, it's fine to test this with a number like 10, but that's probably very low for a production level system. So I'm going to go put this in back to where it was. So again, I have saved all of this as included in part of this uh, video when you extract it there's going to be a file a set of files that are all starting with WMI01 and those are the ones attached for this one so let's come back in the next video and take a look at the WMI data reader